Welcome uh, uh, to uh, five years of Gradle at LinkedIn. I want to start with kind of with, with the very beginnings of that story. There was even before Jens joined, before Stefan joined, it was at Java One 2010. And it was when Gradle was two people, me and Adam, and it was when we had the first conference ever. And man, if you ever do a conference and you do Java One, and I've never done a conference before and have a booth at a conference, they have a 150 pages exhibitor manual. It's like, oh my God, oh my goodness, right? Uh, so we did not everything. We, we, we kind of booked the conference without fully understanding how this works. And then we were at Java One uh, with no back wall, with basically an empty booth because there was some misunderstanding, but just a good set of speakers. <laughs> and it was a great show. And we met the LinkedIn guys. And it was on a Thursday. And then I said, hey, do you want to come by tomorrow and present Gradle? Really interested what you're doing, right? And welcome to the Bay Area, right? So we went there. And it was when Dan Grillo just joined, and I think Dan Grillo's team has had five people. Jens, how, how big is now the overall team of Dan? Yeah. So here we go. And yeah, so that that's, uh, was an amazing story, and you heard the details of that. And uh, But uh, <coughs> the great thing about this partnership, and why it, it is going on for so long, and why it is still full of energy, uh, and why we're still so excited is that our vision is so aligned, where we want to be with uh, uh, the software production process, the continuous delivery process. And, and what also still aligns us very strongly, that we both, that we all feel we just have started. The most exciting stuff is still to come, right? So, and, and uh, the next presentation is about some of the new stuff that I'm pretty excited about. It's about uh, modularization with Java, and it, kind of relates to what Stefan said, how can you make, how do you can make API design a first class citizen, right? So, um, so we start very simple and then we go uh, uh, step by step to the more, to the more uh, elaborate stuff. So um, one thing that distinguishes Gradle from any other build system I know is the richness of the model it provides. Uh, and we are, we at Gradle are now working on the next generation of that model. Uh, the new software model is already available today, but it is not stable yet, nor fully feature complete. But all what you see in this talk is based on a new Gradle software model. The code is in master, you can try it out. So this is all, this is all solid, solid implementation, but not quite ready and not quite fully documented yet. So uh, I'm working full steam on this to get this, to get this kind of production ready as soon as possible. So in the current Gradle model, uh, as most of you know, uh, at, the heart of it, at the heart of what you describe is what type of project is this? You apply the Java plugin, the War plugin, the Android plugin, and you say, this project is of type, you know, whatever the plugin is. At the heart of the new model is a different concept. It's the concept of a component. So let's look at this. So, uh, so those are the new the plugins that describe the new software model, right? And uh, here we declare uh, a single component. The component uh, is of type JVM library. Uh, it has sources, Java sources. We could add other JVM sources, Scala sources, Groovy sources, Clojure sources, right? They would all belong to that component. Uh, so we specify the directory and uh, if you look, uh, uh, there, that this is where the sources are. And we can now do the following. We can say, hey, Gradle, tell me more about the components that are defined in your project, our component report, right? And uh, uh, here we have that information in, in the more structured form. Uh, the project with the name service has one JVM library component called service. And what you can see is this is all very deeply modeled. So there is a, the component has a source, a Java source set. The Java source set has an ID, service colon Java. It represents, in this case, one physical source directory. It could be multiple physical source directories. It could be a filter on an existing source directory. It doesn't matter. Uh, it automatically adds a, a, a JVM resources set. And to a component, uh, uh, for a component, you not just have sources, you also have binaries, right? And that binary gets automatically uh, uh, declared, right? Uh, 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 by by declaring a component, 
uh, in this case you have one binary, a service jar. Uh, you can see the task that you need to run to create this jar. Uh, although you didn't specify the platform, we, we discovered available Java platforms and we make them visible in the component report. And finally, you can see where you can find the binary of this component. Okay, so let's uh, uh, build the component by building the binary, created service jar, right? And you see uh, the source code is compiled. And then wh what this cre create service API jar is about, I will talk about later, but basically the, the jar gets created, the binary jar gets created. And if we now look at the build output directory, you will see the new structure. Uh, yeah, here you have the classes directory with the compiled source files, and here you have the binary uh, in, the, in the service jar directory. For, the, for the examples here, we don't use any versions. It's not necessary, but you might as well declare the versions for those. <coughs> okay, so uh, next example. He, here we have added a second component uh, to the same project. Uh, we call the component client. Uh, and it's also JVM library. This is where we have uh, uh, put the sources and you can now see in the service project, we now have a service and a client component. Uh, this is where the sources of the client component live. And uh, we can now look at the created component report and it will tell us uh, that we have uh, now two components, right? Uh, we talked about the service component. Now we have an additional component in the service project, the client component. Uh, and uh, all the same stuff you can, uh, you, you can learn from the component report about the client component. And uh, let's build the client jar. Oh. Nothing spectacular so far. We built the client jar and uh, yeah, the client sources are compiled and uh, the jar is created. Okay, we can also uh, call assemble, then all the components of the project are built similar to what you, what you have with Gradle now with the current behavior of the assemble task. Okay, so uh, one thing, okay, uh, one thing that is now new in the next example, uh, in a previous example, the client, comp the client code had no dependency on the service component code. This is now changing in the next example. You see we have imported the org cradle example service service package and the client class is using uh, uh, a class from the service component. Oops. Okay. And uh, let, so let's build, ah, okay. Let's build uh, the client component, the client binary. Will it work? It will not work, right? By definition, they're completely isolated from each other, right? So uh, what, you, uh, what the compiler tells you is, uh, uh, hey, I can't find the service class, right? Okay, so what we need to do is we need to de declare a dependency, right? And this is uh, 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 in the client component, we now declare a dependency on the service library, right? And if we now run the build, everything works. You can build the client jar. Okay. So uh, as you have seen, you can have multiple component per Gradle project. Uh, there are many situations where from a build design perspective, it is good to have multiple components in one project. Uh, it depends on their relationship. Uh, the Gradle project is like a Java package, right? Things that are similar and highly coupled, you want to have in the same project, otherwise you want to separate them. So it could be, for example, uh, uh, you might have a, a, a Java library component, a Java application component, a, a documentation component, a JNI component, all in the same project because they belong together, they are tightly coupled, right? Or you have not so coupled component, then you want to put them in separate projects. In this case here, we think it is a better design to put the components into different projects. Uh, so let's do that. Here we have now a service project, right? Uh, which has the service component. And there we have the client project 
which has the client component. The only difference is that the dependency declaration is now a little bit different because now you need to specify not just the component you depend on, but also the project uh, that, that hosts basically uh, the component you depend on, right? Okay, so otherwise uh, nothing has changed. Okay, so one thing our software model allows you to do is to specify the JDK you want to build against. In our previous examples, we did not specify that, right? Uh, we think, though, that it's good practice always to specify the Java platform that you're building against. The build is more reproducible that way, then the information is also captured in version control, and thus provides more reliable historical builds. Uh, in the next example, we're doing exactly this. We're now in the client component and specifying, hey, target platform is Java 8, right? And we do the same in the service component. Target platform is Java 8, okay? Uh, we have exactly the same behavior as before, the build, because the default JDK that was picked up by the build is JDK 8, but maybe tomorrow it will be JDK 9, the default JDK, and then this build might no longer be running unless you have specified the target platform as Java 8, and that way the build is deterministic and reproducible. Um, so more, even more interesting, what if we want to build against multiple versions of Java, right? We could introduce Maven profiles. <laughs> Uh, seriously, uh, one possible solution would be to specify multiple components, one for each platform. But we not, would not like that model. Uh, multiple JDKs do not constitute a different component. There are binary variations of the same component. Uh, and the next example shows how easy it is to work with multiple JDKs in Gradle. You just say, well, I have another target platform, Java 7. Right? That's all you need to do. Right, and in the uh, client component, we do the same, right? Now let's look uh, at the service component at the component report. And now this is getting interesting, right? This is the service component. The sources haven't changed, but you now see there are now two binaries. And you didn't need to do anything. You, not you just needed to say, hey, target platform Java 7. You now have a Java 7 binary, uh, and you call this task to build the Java 7 binary and you have a Java 8 binary. Uh, once you have more than one target platform, the name of the target platform becomes, the name, becomes a part of the name of the binary, right? Uh, and this is where you can find them. So uh, let's build the Java 7 binary. And keep in mind, uh, that, uh, okay, no, uh, we'll talk about that later. Okay, so th this was just the service component, right? Um, now we go to the client component and we, we look at the component report, same story. So let's build, uh, let's build the Java 7 binary of the client component. And keep in mind <laughs> that the dependency is declared between the service component and the client component, or the other way around. The client component has a dependency on the service component. It's not saying the Java 7 binary has a dependency on the Java 7 binary of the service component. It's just abstract. Component depends on component. The rest, Gradle figures out for you. If you build the Java 7 binary, we automatically build uh, uh, the Java 7 binary of client against the Java 7 binary of service, right? We call it variant aware dependency management, which is pretty cool. Um, you can build all the components in client, and then you see that, uh, 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 that it also triggers uh, uh, all the, com the build of all the components in, in service, right? So uh, if you look at the, the build output, you now see that why we have a directory structure. And we're really using different JDKs, so we need to have now two different binary source directories for the, Java for the Java 7 binary, we have the sources, and for the Java 8 binaries, right? Different JDKs, different tool chain that produced those binaries. And then we have a, a different directory for uh, every, every binary jar. Okay. 
So uh, you might wonder what happens if you add Java 6 as a target platform to the client component without having a Java 6 binary for the service component. Let's try. So here we are in the client component project and we just added target platform Java 6. If we look at the service component, there's no target platform Java 6. So if we now build, we look at the component report, you now see there is now a Java 6 binary uh, and we just uh, uh, use the task to build it. What happens? You get a, a, a very uh, informative exception. Cannot find a compatible, bi compatible binary for library service Java 6, available platforms Java 7 and Java 8. And that is extremely helpful. Think about if the build system would not be aware of that, what nasty debugging issues that could cause and how long it could take you to figure this out, especially when you have many, many, many libraries, right? So uh, yeah, let's, let's fix that. We now, we now, in the next example here, we have now added Java 6 uh, as a target platform to the service component. Let's rebuild the client component and now everything works fine, just by adding target platform 6 to the service component. So you might wonder how realistic this example is. You could say, well, in such a tiny project, why would one component be built with uh, Java 6 and the other wouldn't be built with Java 6? So uh, yes, for this little toy example, this is true, but uh, we are involved with some serious monorepo scenarios with uh, uh, organizations having five, 600 sub-projects and completely different teams working on those in different time zones on different continents with not necessarily very functional communication. In such a scenario, it is very likely that one team might make the decision, oh, my sub-project uh, no longer supports Java 6 because I want to use that specific API of Java 7 without making that clear to all the other members in the team, right? So even in a, when you have a large monorepo where it's not a cohesive group of people sitting in the same office building on that, that will already be very helpful. But of course, uh, even more interesting will be a scenario when you not have everything in a single repository, when you have a multiple re multi repo scenario. And of course, all these capabilities will also be available to you when you integrate via binary repositories. So we are working on adding additional metadata uh, to the components we publish so that we, that that, that Gradle can, can read from a binary repository and can, can discover, okay, uh, the client jar, client 1.0 jar in other factory, uh, this version belongs to uh, uh, Java 6, the other version belongs to Java 7. So this, this variant awareness of the target platforms will also work when you're using repositories, right? That's very important. And then it becomes, then it becomes really cool to have that feature. Okay, uh, or you might decide you don't support Java 6 anymore. <laughs> um, so what happens if we build against the target platform Java 9? Uh, so in the client component, we declare there is now a Java 9 binary, but in the service component, uh, th that is the Java 9 version is not available. If we now build the Java 9 client jar, that actually works, right? Because Java is binary backwards compatible, highly reliable, that is a reasonable rule, right? If Java 9 is not there, we can fall back to Java 8. With Scala, that would be a different story, <laughs> right? With Groovy as well, so to be fair, yes. Okay, now we're getting to the heart, the very heart of this talk, to API or not API? That is the question. In the next example, we have added to the service component, an additional package called internal with a service utils class, right? And uh, there is the convention in the organization, whatever is in the internal package is not supposed to be used by other teams, right? Okay, so uh, let's try to use the class of the internal package in <coughs> the client component that depends on the service component. Right, so, so we have two classes, one is internal, the other is public, the service class is public, and uh, we're now looking at the client class, and the client class 
said, yeah, it's internal, but this constant looks so good, right? I, I want to use it. Sorry, guys. I have to release tomorrow. Uh, OK. Fair enough. Uh, let's build the client jar. And everything works, right? So uh, to not API, I would say. Everything works fine. The mess can continue, right? Some half-baked uh, effort to somehow establish API rules. Right. OK. Cradle to the rescue. Uh, in the next example, we are still using the external package in the client component, but the service team is fighting back. They're now using uh, the new Cradle component DSL, where a component can declare its API. It says, hey, this component has an API. And the part of the API is, is, in this case, only this package, right? Org, Cradle, example, service. That is what exported. That is what is exported, nothing else. OK. So what happens if I build a client component? Hey, this failure I love to see, uh, to be honest. Uh, yeah, it says service utils. I can't compile against service utils, right? Uh, cannot find this symbol. So uh, that is, that is what, we, what we have achieved, right? The API is now enforced. So, uh, um, so in the next example, we make the client component buildable again. We removed all. So it still depends on the public API of the service component, but no longer on the internal package. On the implementation of the service component, we rebuild client, and everything works fine. Which is, yeah, pretty cool, uh, adding, getting some discipline into the organization. So the previous example missed an important ingredient. Uh, we haven't used any external dependencies so far, right? So let's add some external dependencies to the service component. So we are back in the service component, and now the service component declares two libraries, Jetty and HTTP client, right? And let's have a look. Uh, how the service component is using those libraries. So there is now the service utils class uses uh, HTTP client, uses the HTTP get class of HTTP client. Um, and we have a new class that is part of the public API, service surflet, which extends default surflet, which again is part of the Jetty, uh, Jetty component. So uh, let's build the whole thing. And everything works fine. We haven't changed anything in client. Client is just using the API of the service component. And, and Gradle has, re has resolved the dependency of the service component to, to build its implementation, right? So no surprise, this should be working, right? So uh, what is interesting now is uh, that the question to API or not API. Uh, our friends from the client team thought, oh, I love when I have all these dependencies available from the, from the components I depend on, right? Why should I declare HTTP client if they have already declared that for me, right? So they're saying, perfect, uh, I use the HTTP get um, class from HTTP client, and uh, that, has, that has always worked so fine with Maven, and it has also worked very well with existing versions, older versions of Cradle. So why not continue that practice? OK, let's see what happens. Right. So yeah, client uh, 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 has the dependency on a service component. But this doesn't work anymore. Right. When, you when client has a dependency on service, and service has declared external dependencies, they're no longer leaking. They're no longer leaking, and uh, which is, I think, a very, very good thing, right? Because you don't want them leaking, for many reasons I will mention uh, in a few minutes. Right? So, uh, so 
because when you think about how it is with Maven or e also currently with Gradle, right? You 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 basically uh, all your packages of your component and all the dependencies, including the whole dependency graph, the uh, transitive dependency graph of all your external libraries, they're all part of the API, right? And it, it's and when a, another component depends on that component, it's fully leaking, right? And uh, uh, that is not a good model. So now we basically uh, uh, cut off the whole external dependencies uh, uh, from any de component that depends on the service component. Um, so what is, uh, let me see, not sure what's going on here. Okay, we, we fixed it, we removed the dependencies right from the, uh, 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 on the uh, on the HTTP client dependency, and, and I can now build the client component again. But there is a, there is a more interesting use case here that that has not shown uh, itself. There is a, it's a little bit more complex than that. This is, if that were the solution, huh, then then Gradle would have already implemented that five years ago by just making the compile configuration non-transitive. But the situation is a little bit more complex than that. <laughs> so if you look at the at the client component. The client component is now adding a client servlet class, right? <coughs> and the client servlet class extends the service servlet class, which is absolutely fine. The client team has finally learned, right? They're only using the public API. So they're absolutely, uh, uh, they're absolutely, uh, it's absolutely okay that they're using uh, and extending the service servlet class. So uh, what happens? Right, and here's the server servlet class, and remember, it extends default servlet, which is part of Jetty. So, uh, what happens if I build the client jar? Any ideas? It works. Any any other opinions? <laughs> hey, yes, diversity. Ah, that's what I want. Yes. So, uh, yes, uh, it doesn't work. Because the compiler says, yeah, a service servlet, I have in my class path. But service, when you're extending a class, right, you're also exposing the API of that class. Right? That is why the compiler says, I can't compile, I can't compile client servlet without the default servlet class. Because client servlet is extending that class. Right? So uh, and from a if you think about it from a from an API perspective, if someone is using client servlet, this person is also using classes from default servlet. So default servlet in that case must be part of the API, right? So and and uh, so you can't compile it. Uh, so what do we do now? Back to zero, letting all dependencies leak into uh, the dependent components? No. Uh, we have a new, what, we, what you can now do with Gradle, you can say, hey, uh, if you want that a dependency is, is part of the API, you can now tell Gradle for Jetty, export it is equals true. And that means if client depends on service, it will, it means it will depend on all the exported packages of the service component plus the exported external dependencies of the service component. So, uh, Let's compile it, and now everything is fine and it works. Um, so, what do we have achieved? Uh, I think we have achieved something pretty spectacular. We have uh, dramatically reduced the surface area of the API of the service component. And this example is not even representative. Usually, right, you have, let's say, 30 external dependencies, and maybe zero or one a part of your API. So you just by, and then those 30 dependencies have a massive dependency graph, right? You might have now removed hundreds of external dependencies from the API of your class, right? And the same is true for the packages, right? You have many, many packages, and if your API is reasonably designed, only a few packages will uh, 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 constitute the surface area of the API, right? Uh, and and with, with, this, with this new model, uh, only those those packages will be exposed. Uh, and reducing the surface area of the API is one of the key goals when structuring and organizing 
your code bases. It's, a, it's an epic problem. The structure of code bases is an epic problem. Not quite as old as humanity, but uh, yeah, 40 years old. Uh, it's much underappreciated, uh, and its ne negligence is dearly paid for, right? It's one of the things you pay for, you pay heavily for it uh, if you ignore it, although most people are ignoring it. Uh, so why is that? The key reason is public APIs are super expensive, and the larger the surface area is, the more expensive they are. Whether you provide an API to other teams in your organization or to the world, it doesn't change that fact, right? Uh, they impose massive refactoring constraints. Uh, see the Java itself, right? Uh, they require elaborate testing to make sure that you don't break the contract uh, as you are moving forward. Uh, so uh, they can bring your development speed to a crawl. They can get you stuck. Uh, talk to the JDK folks how ha hard it was to make the JDK modular after the fact. Some of the smartest engineers on the planet have invested years of effort to make the JDK finally modular, right? Uh, talk to us from Gradle as a platform provider with now one million downloads per month. Uh, how, how much we invest, and Stepan mentioned that, to guarantee backwards compatibility, uh, but at the same time continue to innovate, innovate uh, that we only can do that because we are very picky about what we are making public API and what not. If we, would, if we would say, hey, everything is public API, we could go home, right? Yeah, then LinkedIn, then there wouldn't be any the next five years at LinkedIn, right? Or we had to create a completely new build system, right? So, uh, and we see, see many organizations deeply suffering from that. They are stuck, right? People just pick whatever they want from, from the components and then, and then the teams that, that are basically upstream, they can't do any changes anymore and it's just, uh, it's, it's a high cost. So, uh, Good structure with a minimized API surface area is first and foremost a question of good package design, right? If every package is having cyclic dependencies with each other, uh, you can't reduce the surface area, right? Uh, uh, no tool can help you then. Uh, so it is a big part of our craft as software engineers to have good package design. Cohesiveness per package, loosely coupli coupling between packages, directed dependencies with no cycles, not new stuff. I mean, Uncle Bob wrote about that 10 years ago in his book, Agile Software Development. I'm sure there are older books about that, right? And very valuable stuff, but I rarely see that implemented in most organizations. So, uh, uh, so all developers should understand that. Uh, this will enable you to continue to move fast and don't get stuck. And uh, the reality for me is the reason why we don't see this implemented more often is that tooling is not supporting that. Without good tooling, good package design is rarely ever achieved and thrown under the bus first thing in the morning. That's my experience, right? So, uh, so what, what we can do with, with this Gradle capabilities, we can finally enforce the API, right? And uh, if something is internal, it cannot be used by a consumer, you create boundaries. And uh, it's similar to what Stepan mentioned when he said, uh, with, the, with, the, with enforcing semantic versionings, you force people to think about their API, right? You, you create a boundary, right, in terms of the build will fail if you, don't, if you don't think about certain things. And the same is true here on a, on a little bit more detailed level, right? Boundaries enforce thinking, collaboration, and deliberate decisions. You can't just grab any internal class anymore. That means people will check the API twice, whether there might not be a public way to achieve what they want to achieve. And if you really need something, you can collaborate with the API author. Uh, they might provide you a workaround. Uh, it's good for them to understand your needs. Uh, all in all, what it does, it makes API design a first-class citizen that is no longer always thrown under the bus. And I think that is a great thing. Um, what we cannot wait to tackle is to provide you metrics that help you uh, in evolving the API. How is your API used? which of its exported dependencies are used, uh, which changes break the contract. You can make really, really uh, cool stuff to also let the upstream teams know when they broke the downstream teams because we have now a much better idea of, of, uh, uh, of what is the API of that component. Um, so uh, something else. I, in Germany, there's a very popular uh, fairy tale from the brother Grimm 
uh, Star Tala. Uh, it's about a girl that by living up to certain values gets a very unexpected reward. And uh, uh, the same is true when you stick to good API design. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, don't, don't go out in the night and, you know, that uh, probably that will not happen, but something else will happen. Uh, so, uh, with good API design, and I will talk about jigsaw integration in a, in a, in a, in a, in a minute, uh, with Java 9, it will give significantly less points of attack for exploits due to the reduced surface area that is accessible, right? And I know some studies from the JDK team, 70% of all security issues in the JDK of the last years were related to uh, uh, that people were attacking internal classes and with Jigsaw, uh, uh, they could have been avoided, right? So the same is true for your code, right? So if you reduce the surface area, there are less points of attack, right? Uh, be it your code or the external dependencies you are using. So I wouldn't underestimate that. Uh, build performance, uh, that's something we are super excited about. Uh, so by, by being precise about your API, we, we, we Cradle is able to do much less recompiles. And I will show uh, uh, an example very soon. So uh, let's look at this 19 submodule Gradle build. It's a pretty juicy build. Every, every component here has 2,000 Java source files. So all, over, all in all, it constitutes uh, several million lines of code, Java project. And uh, so component two, or project two, three, four to nine, depend on component one. Uh, 10 depends on two, 11 on 10, you, you get the idea, right? And uh, what we want to do now is uh, we want to build component 15, which depends on 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, and then two and one. So and this is when you build, have to build all the components it depends on, right? We can, I can continue with my talk and uh, uh, can make one or two <laughs> points. I want to, 10 seconds, right? Uh, and this is basically, when if you're using Maven, right? Uh, uh, this, is, this is what you always have to do when you change 15, everything needs to be recompiled, you're always doing a clean build. So if you do an incremental build with Gradle, when nothing has changed, this is uh, much, much faster, but usually you do only a build if something is changing. So let's look at this situation, right? So uh, here we have project one, Right, we have uh, the component in project one, the main component. It has a, a, a dependency on an external library and it exports the package performance one underscore one. So and now we go into one underscore two package. So package that is not, imp not exported, right? One, dot one underscore one is exported. And now we go into one of the classes and do some changes change the implementation of a method, change the signature of a method, right? We can do whatever we want, right? As long as it compiles. And we're now rebuilding the whole thing and it's now only two seconds because we only needed to recompile project one, right? Project two doesn't need to be recompiled because the API hasn't changed. There's no dependency, we don't need to recompile. So let's do something else. Let's use the new Cradle continuous mode for the fun of it. Now Cradle automatically checks for changes. Uh, so now let's go into, uh, into a class of performance one underscore one of the exported package and change an implementation of a method. To be clear, when you export an API, it doesn't mean you just export interfaces, right? You API also have classes that have an implementation, right? Uh, but, it, but those are classes you can use. And uh, we just changed the implementation of an API class. Build was very fast again. And uh, what you can see also in this case, because we changed only the implementation, Gradle is now very smart about that. Uh, Cradle figured out, hold on, although an API class change, you only change the implementation of a method, I don't need to recompile project two, right? Now let's do something else. Let's change the signature 
of an API class, right? Okay. Now Cradle kicks in, but it's still very fast, and that's a very, very interesting use case. So we built, we rebuilt project one, and we also recompiled project two, because the signature has changed, right? But because project two is not exporting project one in its API, we don't need to recompile any of the other projects that depend on project two. And now, and, that, and this is now a big, big chunk of potential changes, right? So, so because it's not leaking, you, you only have a direct, uh, what happened here? I did something, I think that, okay, that, that was basically, yeah, that was the example, it has restarted itself. So, uh, uh, and, and that, that dramatically improves developer feedback time, right? So, so we, are, we are super excited about this. And, and the same is true if you change now dependency versions, right? For dependencies that are not exported, Nothing needs to be recompiled, right? Only the project, the component itself needs to be recompiled, none of the projects that depend on that. So that is easily 90, 99, 95%, depending on your dependency graph, of reasons why at the moment, with classical build systems, you need to do full recompile with Gradle, this is no longer necessary, right? And that, that's, that's very cool. The other thing I should point out, we have dramatically improved uh, the incremental, the up-to-date checking time, right? So if you, if you look uh, uh, back at this example, I can't. Uh, okay, that was the first. Let's wait for the 10 seconds again. So those are 40,000 source files, right? Or 38,000. Uh, uh, and the incremental build time is now 1.2 seconds. If you take into account that the Cradle client JVM takes 500 milliseconds to start up. If we had native clients, that would only be 700 milliseconds for checking uh, uh, 38,000 source files. So that is compared to Cradle to eight. It depends on, on your project, but it's a, it's a significant improvement, right? So, so I can, uh, and, and compared to Cradle to seven. So I can, the, the, the biggest chunk of that is in Cradle to nine, which will be out, I think, yeah, next week or something like that. So, so that is, from a performance perspective, a really recommendable upgrade. And we are not done yet. We, we get this even more down, right? So that's, that's, uh, uh, that's uh, very, I'm very excited about that. Okay, so uh, Jigsaw and Cradle, right? Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, integration of Cradle and Jigsaw. So first of all, uh, the interesting question, how to get modular now? There is no reason to wait. Uh, uh, as discussed, with Gradle, you get tremendous benefit out of this on Java 7 and Java 8. You can, f you can enforce modularization without uh, uh, requiring Jigsaw. At the same time, it means you will be ready for Jigsaw once it's out. So what should be the process? So what we, what we recommend is uh, enforce the current API in whatever set or not so sad shape your API is. Lock it down, make it explicit, prevent it from further deteriorating, right? Prevent even more internal packages from leaking out. Start making it a first class citizen, start changing the culture, right? What Gradle will eventually provide is a tool with which you can capture the current API by analyzing the dependencies between all the packages and all the components. So, so this is not really designing API, this is okay, what is the state today, right? So, so all the exported packages will be derived on the usage of all the dependent packages, right? But, but after that, it is locked down. So that is, uh, uh, so that is, that is the first step. Uh, and uh, then start continuous improvement. Do the hard, sweaty work of improving, you reducing your API by refactoring your packages, deprecating stuff, and fi finally removing what is in the way, right? And uh, Enforce the improved API, right? And go back to two. <laughs> this will be your new, new life, basically, right? <laughs> so uh, educate your developers on how to organize the code properly so that you have good API design. One very nice side effect of Jigsaw is that it comes with the authority of the JDK. It tells the Java world that API is now a first class citizen. I mean, LinkedIn is telling this already, there are folks, but in many organizations, there's not much awareness around that. Uh, 
It's not an esoteric discipline to think about that. It's now a first class citizen of the JDK. And this will ma make it much easier to get the organization behind it, I think. Right? So uh, once you're ready to move to Java 9, it will be pretty simple. You just declare, hey, I'm on Java 9 target platform right, with my service component. And then you, uh, you declare your exported dependencies in Gradle. And you just say, hey, Cradle, build me the Java 9 service jar. And you see uh, something with Jigsaw <laughs> in the task list. So if you look at the build, you see Cradle has generated the module info.java for Jigsaw and is now part of the Java 9 binary jar. Right? So if we go back to the IDE, you're ready to move to Jigsaw. Right? As easy as that. Uh, so, and Gradle makes it so easy to start experimenting with Jigsaw easy early, right? Because you can now work with multiple JDKs. So even if you are on, JD on Java 8, right, it's super easy to start doing some experiments, right? And uh, uh, without investing a lot of time into uh, changing your uh, build script or adding build logic to make that possible. Um, so. Uh, there are a couple of uh, other things that are, that are interesting I would like to mention. Uh, so first of all, what we, uh, will, uh, what we will refine uh, with upcoming versions of that is the concept of a tool chain. So uh, at the moment you just say target platform Java 9, but we want to make it uh, easy that you can define uh, this is a target uh, platform Java 9 with Jigsaw, and this is target platform Java 9 without Jigsaw. So that you can even say, let's do an incremental move to Java. Uh, let's, let's have one platform where we're still using the old class pass system, and then and if, that, if that is working, then let's try to move to Java 9 with Jigsaw. Right? The other thing that is, of course, very interesting is uh, 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 what you can now, what you could easily do now with Gradle by having uh, defined uh, an API is that you can, uh, that when you're using Jigsaw, you can get rid of a lot of your version conflicts, right? Because dependencies that are not exported will be not exposed by Jigsaw. So the module info Gradle is creating, uh, for example, for the service component, right, will not expose the dependency on HTTP client, right? So Jigsaw will shadow this. So what you have with Java 8 is that when you run your tests, right, all the dependencies, of course, are thrown together, thrown together, all the implementation dependencies, and you have potentially the same version conflicts that you have right now, right? Uh, at on, uh, with Java 8, we can only basically isolate all those dependencies during compile time. With Java 9, they will be isolated also during runtime. So, and that is an opportunity that many version conflicts that you have right now don't show up anymore because uh, if a dependency is not exported, let's say uh, the service component can now easily use a different version of HTTP client than another component, and Jigsaw will isolate, uh, isolate them via, via their, their class loader isolation. So that is a very interesting step forward in the Java world, right? And uh, will hopefully we will have le much less uh, uh, version conflict problems. Okay, so last thing, uh, in a Java 9 plus world, people may wonder how things will look like uh, from a Gradle perspective. Uh, so you can continue to declare your API in Gradle and we generate the module info out of that. Or if you want, you can use the module info.java file of Jigsaw uh, as the master file, and then Cradle will read it to do its smart compile avoidance and things like that. For us, it's just a different place where you persist that information. We don't, we don't care. Both will work fine for us. Um, I need to talk about, yeah, maybe a quick, uh, uh, some things about the roadmap. Uh, so one thing that we have just added two days ago is that you can have now sources, specific sources per binary. So you can have sources, let's say, in service Java, sources that are shared between all the binaries. And then you can declare sources that are just used for the Java 7 binary, just used by the Java 8 binary. Right? So uh, I don't 
And, and the next thing we, we're going to pursue is that you can have also dependencies per JDK, right? So that you can, that, that you can declare different dependencies for different, for different binaries. Uh, 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 so for example, you, you, the, the, the JD servlet dependencies would be used by all the binaries, but the HTTP client 441 only by the Java 8 binaries and HTTP clients 451 only by the Java 9 binary, right? I'm not sure if you're aware of JEP 238. That is one part of Java 9 is the concept of a multi-release jar. So uh, they, one second, I'm running out of battery. So with this release jar, they, uh, what, what, you can, what you can do is uh, that uh, you can have Java release specific version of class files and you can specify them in a manifest file, right? So under jar root, you have all the classes that are shared and then you have can have classes that, that should be only used when run on Java 8 and classes that are only used when run on Java 9. And that is, uh, uh, as I said, it will be a standard of Java 9. Uh, so obviously it's easy for us to support that with the mechanism I've shown. I'm not sure if, if, if it's the best way to solve that problem. If you work, let's say, with legacy build systems, it might be a good thing to have. But uh, the problem is that with the multi-release jars, you can't have different external dependencies per Java version, right? And I think that is a real limitation. And, and so, so if you're a Gradle, Gradle user, I think the way Gradle deals with multiple platforms is, is a more sophisticated and, and more powerful way. In any case, we will also, in any case, we will also support the multi-release jar. Okay, so almost at the end, uh, we are releasing uh, very soon uh, a SAS offering that allows you to connect your local OCI builds with Cradle. Uh, the service will help you in understanding why something is wrong with your build or why the build thing, something is wrong with your code. <laughs> uh, maybe even something is wrong in some areas of your organization. Uh, we're super excited about that. We hope we can release it very soon. So sign up for the better and, and you will be the first one uh, that, that, that can join Gradle.com and will get notified when, when it's live. Uh, if, you want, if you know someone and wants to learn more about Gradle, there is an excellent Udacity class uh, out there, Gradle for Android and Java, it's free, uh, uh, very high quality, uh, super good content and produced in cooperation with, with us, uh, Google and Udacity. I hope we get some Linda classes out there very soon. <laughs> and uh, on Gradle, Gradle itself, Gradle, Gradle Inc. offers also excellent training. Uh, instructor-led trainings from, from some of the you know, outstanding Cradle engineers. So if you want to dive really deep into Cradle, those classes are, are priceless. So I think for anyone who wants to tackle something challenging with Cradle, there is nothing that, that is more efficient uh, uh, than, than going to, to some of those classes and, and learning deeply about typical enterprise problems that, that you can, how you can solve them best with, with Cradle. That was from Java 1. That's <laughs> That's not, that's not the case here. Yeah, any questions? Thank you. No, it, is, uh, it can't be smarter than that yet because we depend still on the POM XML. So there are two, so, so, there, so it's a very good question. The situation is even a little bit, there's, e there's even a bigger problem in that because we not, we not just include the JETI jar, but we also include the transitive dependencies of JETI, which includes the servlet API and comments codec and comments logging and stuff like that. The POM XML doesn't give us enough information, so we will work on a better metadata format where this stuff can be declared and then we can do a smarter job. The problem is, as soon as you leave the realm of Gradle and you enter the realm of Maven POM XML, you just don't have the information. So once, so, so moving to a Gradle metadata format in the future will make this much better. And then of course, Jigsaw will have, once, once all the libraries that are out there have Jigsaw module info, you will also be in a much better information, but it will take quite a few years until we are there. So good question. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so the question was, 
can we set an external binary? Like R Factory 4, the plug in, in the plug-in closure. But in a, in a in the plug-in closure? The new yes, OK, so completely separate question, right? Yeah, yes. Uh, yeah, it is. I mean, you, you can already uh, uh, access our current plugin repository as a Maven repository, but uh, probably you know that, right? But, but then it doesn't work with the new thing. Yes, that is on our list, absolutely. Before that, our new plugin system is not production ready, basically. And the second one is. Yes. So, would you really need to? Yes. So, uh, yes. The question is uh, what, what should be the policies around testing, right? So, because if you have changed the implementation of project one, you don't need to recompile project two, but you might still want to run the tests of project two, right? But we'll know which class. Uh, so that is a, yeah, it's an interesting question, right? It depends. So we want to do something about incremental testing. It's an unsolved problem yet, right? So uh, we, we, know, we know which production classes have changed, but even with the current Gradle, with incremental compile, we would know that, right? Uh, so I'm not sure how much this relates to API versus implementation, or whether this is almost unrelated, a very important but unrelated topic. You know what I mean? We just have the utility. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, we are thinking deeply about that, uh, how we do that, whether we do it with graph analysis, whether we use coverage information to understand the uh, association between tests and production classes. So we are not exactly sure yet how we, how we pursue that. Our, our favorite is that we use the coverage information to understand, OK, if those production classes have changed, those tests need to be rerun. Right? That is, uh, but that, that is, but it's, pretty, it's a pretty separate piece of work. That is something we could also do for, for the existing Gradle version, even without defining the API and the implementation. Right? Yeah, cool. Unless you say, uh, like some organizations, oh, I, I only, for dependent components, I only care about that the API hasn't changed. If the implementation changed, that, that doesn't trigger a, a test. But that is, that is a pretty risky policy. I know some organizations that have that. That's pretty risky. Yeah. Please. So in the yes. So the service surplus class was extending a class from an external dependency. Yes, but, but when you declare dependency on a servlet, it means for compile time, you only depend on the API of the service component, right? So, so you can't access any implementation code of the service component by default. That includes the external dependencies you have declared, plus the packages that are not exported. Uh, so, and there was another update into the exportable rule, right? Pardon? Uh, Export rule, yes. Yeah, if yeah, you can do. I mean, you could you, you could write an easy you could create an easy rule with Gradle. All dependencies should be exported by default. Yes. Then we are in a tool, not API world, right? But Gradle is a humble tool. Whatever you want, it does it, right? The components are the same as Maven module. No, I think they're much richer. You can you will be able to map them to Maven modules, uh, uh, but that's a separate. I wouldn't say they are the same. So with Maven, you wouldn't be able to model an API. So no, they are not the same. They are not the same. But there is a, there will be a bridge if you like. You mentioned somewhere. Yeah, as a joke. Oh, that's okay. as a joke. As a as a crazy way of solving that problem, right? As a kind of you know, yeah, it was just a joke. Uh, yeah, you don't want to solve uh, binary dependency management with if statements. In the, you know, that's that's. But not in general. Pa pardon? Uh, well, with Maven, you don't have a choice. It's your only friend to survive, but it gets you into hell. So it's a, it's a, it's a very, yeah, yeah. But with Gradle, no, it's a good question. With Gradle, I mean, the thing is, the Maven profile is just a, a pretty dumbed down if statement, right? So, so it, it's a pro if a property is set, execute this, otherwise execute that. So it's, uh, uh, 
with cr that is that is why we have that rich model and we have variants and things like that that it's a much more object oriented approach it's the same thing when in your production code you have every way if statements that is a smell right you th should think can't i use that with polymorphism or whatnot and so it's the same in that respect it's the same thing right so yeah you're welcome okay so so uh, i mean of course with 2.8 uh, with, with Java 8, we can only enforce modularization at build time, right? Of course, right? So, so only during build time we can enforce that. Makes sense, right? Uh, uh, and uh, for your open source library, uh, I think your open source library needs to have a little bit more patience because <laughs> all the Maven consumers, uh, what, what can they do, right? So, uh, so so what Gradle offers, offers organizations that are fully onto Gradle, that they can now enforce the API. If you publish a library, I mean, you could do stuff. You could do things like uh, with the Gradle plugin uh, that with the information we have, we publish two binaries, right? Two artifacts, an API artifact and a dependency artifact. And the API artifact depends on the dependency artifact. You could do stuff like this with Gradle. And then on the compiled scope, you depend only on the API artifact, and in runtime scope of Maven, you, you also depend on the implementation artifact. It's a, it's a lot of manual work so to make that use with Maven, but it's possible. Is yes, so uh, the, the, that, is, that is a future step, right? The future step for us is that we, that we provide that we model services, real services, not a service jar library, a service as a first class citizen cradle land. So that we have a component where you can say, this is a service component, right? And, and that has a life cycle, right? And that, that, has a, that, that, has, that needs certain other things to start up and that can publish certain APIs, certain SDKs to use it. That is something that we, want to, that we desperately want to model sometimes next year, right? Uh, and then, we will have first class support for the problems you have described that we really can, that runtime services is a first class citizen in greater land. Right now, that is not modeled, right? So you could create something around that yourself, but you wouldn't, yeah, you would, you would need to, you would, yeah, you would need to, 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 to do this yourself, basically. So in this case, we are different, so the, with the current cradle, you, you're using one JDK with different source compatibility settings. Here, you, you usually you're, you're using actually different JDKs, right? So if you say seven, you don't use eight with Java seven source compatibility. You use a, a real Java seven JDK. That's not a big problem. Yes. So. That's yes. No. It's a good. So 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 just to understand you. So basically, we would Cradle would would figure out for this type of code we would recommend we automatically use this JDK. So basically, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, I mean, you, you would be, you could do this, you could write something like this today in, a, uh, in an extension, right? That you, uh, I'm not sure if it's a good idea. You know, you know for certain stuff, I think it's good to make an explicit, to somehow, it's a matter of taste to some degree, but I think certain things should be should be a conscious decision. This is this is the platform I, I want to use. And if a new developer joins this project, uh, they it, it they shouldn't say, oh, well, I have this wonderful auto discovery thing, so I can use I can use uh, the better of Java nine because my build system will discover it and will not complain about it. And then you're moving to production, and you, you know what I mean. So so. It's now a question of taste. My general sentiment would be make it explicit against which Java version you want to work against and communicate it, right? But this kind of behavior wouldn't be black magic to implement, right? We could, we could implement that in some extension with some you know, discovery, but I'm not sure if that, is, if, that is, if that is the default behavior we would want. Yeah, there's a lot, definitely a lot of interesting stuff we can do with once API is first class citizen, right? In terms of uh, 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 g providing additional services, as you have described, doing very interesting checks uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, enforcing compatibility ch changes and, and stuff like that, right? So, but yeah. And the last thing I want to mention is uh, 
So the stuff you have seen, as, as mentioned, that is the new Cradle software model. So it is not well documented yet. We expect to have a very, uh, a very solid kind of MVP for trying things out in January, right? You can use it today. Everything will work, right? It just will be uh, not, not completely easy to, 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 to read about how it works and things like that. So, so that is kind of the time frame, January, where, you, where we will also n announce in, I think it would be 10 or 2.11, you know, that, that, that we now invite everyone to, to really start using this, right? So, Eric. Yes. So, I guess every platform I is very different here. Uh, but what we, what we have really achieved with the new software model, that there are a lot of generic, now, generic components that allow you to model this, this stuff. For example, one very important thing is the variant aware dependency management, right? That you have, that you can have, uh, that we pick when you depend, when you are a Java 7 component, we only pick the Java 7 component for the dependency, right? So that is something, that is a generic thing. If you would do that for JavaScript, you could, you could declare your own variant universe, right? Saying, oh, I don't know, minified, minified, and, and things like that. So that is now available as underlying infrastructure that you can use, right? Uh, so, so yes, it will be much easier now f to, to model that in other domains. Uh, and, and for the first, basically for the domains we support as first class citizens, we will do that, right? And then, but it's now also for the community, basically contributors like, like your JavaScript stuff, you would have, it would be now much easier to, to provide this kind of capabilities, but it's still, this stuff is domain specific, right? So it needs to be explicitly modeled uh, as a high level function for a specific domain with very specific behavior, right? Like the fallback rules, right? In Java, if uh, Java 9 not available, you can fall back to Java 8, right? With Scala, this is not possible. Uh, with C++, it would be 64-bit, you can fall back to 32-bit, right? Uh, uh, but not, not the other way around and things like that. But uh, there, there is, there's domain-specific stuff. Yes, with Scala it will be that will be pretty pretty easy. Once this is solved for Java, to yeah, that will be very straightforward. And and that is probably something we will do anyhow also ourselves, right? That yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks.